Hi, everyone. I just want to, oh, am I, okay, sorry. I froze for just a second. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We have Dr. Rowe. I'm going to go ahead and let her get jump right on in there because I know there's a lot to cover. Um, in the last time we did this in person, we were really up until the last second. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Jess Coburn, Director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. Mary Rose is also with us, Assistant Director of DEI. Um, and we are so happy to have Dr. Tara Rowe here with us. So I will let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you. And and I should uh, I should have prefaced this with normally when I do this presentation I always include some kind of icebreaker that I do with the students but because of the, for the sake of time I'm not going to so all of you guys are lucky I'm not making you turn on your cameras and come up with like a, a name for yourselves and so you can appreciate I'm sure you'll be much more um, happy that I'm not making you guys all do this but yes just 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 did a great introduction I'm Tara I'm actually the assistant director of our student accessibility services at the University of North Florida and one of the things that's also under my um, administrator stuff is the Thrive program. I actually helped start it 10 years ago, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But just to kind of give everyone an idea of what to expect for today, we're going to talk a little bit about autism, neurodiversity, and then we're going to jump straight into some of the challenges that faculty uh, members experience, also staff and campus um, administrators might experience working with neurodiverse students. But the most important thing is I you're not going to get as much out of this if you don't ask or if you don't um, put your hand up or put something in the chat. This time, this next hour is 100% for, for you guys or for, for everyone in on this call just because I do this all day every day. So sometimes um, I'm just in my zone and I don't stop to think or explain why I'm using a specific strategy. So the best thing you can do is make notes and ask as many questions as possible. I actually prefer um, questions because it really does um, pause or it helps me pause and really think about, okay, so why am I using this strategy? How have I, what is this based on? It only helps if, if I'm asked. So let's jump right in. Uh oh, there we go. So really quickly, and I, um, and I can share these slides. I have the actual definitions of autism and then neurodiversity. Um, and I, we're not in person, so we can't raise hands, but neurodiversity is a term that we're starting to see a lot more um, in, in conversations about uh, learning differences and neurodivergence. And really what I wanted to do was take a minute to explain how is it different from saying a student has autism, or in some cases, some individuals prefer the term autistic, I'm autistic. And really it is a very much person-centered, person-first. So it's up to the individual how they prefer to be um, identified. I have some of my students who do not want to be identified at all as um, having a diagnosis which is completely their choice. And some of my students prefer the term neurodiverse, but just to give you an idea, the, the definition of autism, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's typically characterized by deficits or challenges in social communication, in um, repetitive behaviors, let me make sure I have this, in social interactions. So those are things that are kind of pretty typical that are associated with that, that um, diagnosis definition. And that is from the DSM, that's not something that's opinion-based or education-based. Um, neurodiversity, though, is more of an umbrella term, and actually neurodiversity includes diagnoses such as dyslexia, uh, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, autism, um, even some ADHD and learning disabilities fall under this term of neurodiversity because of the definition of neurodiversity, which is that um, different process, different way of thinking. Mary Rose, I see something in the chat, but I'm not going to distract myself, so I'm going to trust you 100% with this. So how, how does my um, how does my program, how do we support students who identify as being on the spectrum or as um, being neurodiverse? And I'm going to give you a really quick background because it'll set the stage for how we support students on campus. But THRIVE stands for a transition to healthiness, resourcefulness, independence, vocation, and education. And we started the program in 2012 with six students volunteering to participate and meet with mentors. And I was one of the original students. There were three of us that started it. And since then, we've grown tremendously. And right now, this semester is still fall. We have more than 130 students who are matriculating, who also identify as having a diagnosis of autism that are participating in our program. One of the biggest components of our program, though, is the peer mentoring aspect. 
And we're going to talk a little bit more about like that positive peer support that has um, some, just has significant impact on student success, especially neurodiverse students, and having um, a sense of belonging and a sense of um, engagement on campus. Um, so Thrive, we have our own living learning community on campus, and so housing is a very big part of it. And there's no cost for students to participate in Thrive. So I kind of gave you that in a nutshell. I'm going to keep on going. Are we good? I think somebody was unmuted and I heard something. It was me. Do you, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, I was just telling you that Mary Rose just wrote in the chat, like, if you have questions, feel oh. free to unmute yourself or write it here. So that's what you saw in the chat. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, good. I'm glad I didn't click it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So um, what you what you see on this slide, and this is why I had told Jess that yes, I'm happy to share this because um, it's a little bit difficult to find some some really accurate uh, statistics that depict neurodiversity in higher education because there's so many factors that affect how we are tracking and how we're reporting it. One of the biggest factors is that students, and you see this even at Flagler, students who may disclose to a faculty member, well, hey, I'm on the spectrum, may not register with campus accessibility services. So those are students who are on campus and they're a presence. However, they're not actually counted in any data or statistics in terms of who's using the services on campus. So that's why even the number, it's the third bullet down, it says 0 0.3 to 1.9. It's a pretty big discrepancy when you're, th this is nationwide. Um, and that's one of the biggest factors is not every student, um, if even if they do have a formal diagnosis, and there's also um, students without a formal diagnosis who, who identify as being on the, on the spectrum and they're not necessarily included in that. But more than anything, um, what's, what I always highlight is the second bullet. So almost 20% of undergraduate students report having some type of disability. And this is students who are using academic accommodations. That can be everything from note taking to extended time on tests to having a reduced course load. And every institution has different definitions and how they provide these services. And I think just said that there was even someone from your student accessibility office who might be here. And because every institution is different, I'm gonna I can talk about what UNF does, but the way Flagler uh, processes and handles um, accommodation requests is gonna, might be completely different. So if that person's not on one question. Mm -hmm. So one uh, person asked, should we prompt them to register? Oh, yes, absolutely. 100%. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. Always, always, always recommend it because it's one of those things where not everybody will know only the staff. And I'll explain it from my, my campus. Um, every student that I meet with, the number one thing I tell them is make sure that you've notified, especially classroom accommodations, make sure you've notified your professor at the start of the semester. Even if you don't plan to use your accommodations, you've communicated to this faculty member that you are registered with this office. So if there's any concerns, the professor's wondering why you're not doing well, they've tried to reach out to the student, but it seems like there's no connection. The student having just um, sent the professor, hey, I'm registered with this office, that faculty member now can reach out to our office and we can be a mediator and a support system for both faculty and the student, which is why that is so important to register with the office. Then the student's not completely on their own trying to figure out how to navigate and figure things out. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. But um, actually, Jess or Mary Rose, would one of you two be okay if there are like accessibility service questions for Flagler? Would it be okay if I pointed? Mm -hmm. Just because, okay, I just didn't want, I don't want to speak for behalf. Everybody's so different. Yes, so, we also have um, Anita is here. I don't know if she's um, comfortable coming off chat or anything, but she's the accommodations clerk. So she works in the um, office perfect. of, or the Disability Resource uh, Center. So I, will yes, put, I, won't, here. I, will, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. <laughs> I, I don't appreciate when that happens to me. <laughs> but just in case, if there is a question about Flagler, I love to defer back to you because it is so unique and so specific to each campus that I want to make sure that the information that we're sharing is really appropriate and applicable for you guys. Sure. Keep saying you guys. Uh, for everyone. All right. The only um the only other two, two things I was going to um, highlight the graduation rate for neurodiverse students is forty one percent. This is matriculating students, and then so and this is we there's a lot of research looking at this, and it's actually some of the things that I've been starting to collect data on. And then the last bullet that unemployment rate for neurodiverse college graduates, so students who've graduated with a degree. Unemployment rate is at 85%, which is astronomically higher than any other disability group, um, matriculating disability group that's graduated from college. And so there are, again, lots of factors why this might be. 
one of the biggest things that we've seen on our campus is the focus is so much on academics that students are really um, behind in developing professional skills, interpersonal skills, um, social skills, like unwritten workplace skills, like how do I talk to my professor and how does that relate to talking to a, a potential boss or becoming overly reliant on accommodations to um, see or to get a student through school, not necessarily being able to generalize those accommodations to the workplace. So how does having extended time or having a note taker, how is that something I can take to my workplace or to this new job I'm interested in pursuing? And there's not really an opportunity to um, overlap those. And so a lot of what our program does is focus on those skills because otherwise students are graduating, but we want them to leave with um, a set of skills and tools that we know are going to help them be successful. Okay. <laughs> So here, here's here's what we did from the last time we were um, have covering this topic. Um, here, I Jess, you're going to even see I added a fourth one because this was not on there previously. But just from the conversations and then from Jess sharing who's attending today's session, these are some of the challenges that we on our campus and then some of my collaborations um, with other institutions in the country um, that we've just we've identified as being some of the primary areas of difficulty for students um, who identify as neurodiverse. Housing, and I did it so that I could actually see my own notes. Yes, because there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, so how how have we addressed some of these challenges? And and please, if these if you have more specific questions about academic advising or about housing, feel free to put it in the chat and we can talk about them. But for for us specifically, housing is probably our biggest partner for our my office because so many of the, the issues and challenges that students were experiencing happen after hours. They happen on the weekends when there's no classes or they happen at night after a sporting event or, and they were, they were really occurring during non-business hours. So there was nobody really around on campus to help um, address whatever might be going on. So partnering with housing was a major, major component of our pr program when we first started. And everything from doing orientation trainings with RAs, not just the RAs who are in the Thrive LLC floor, but any of the um, any of the housing buildings on campus, because there are students who are not in Thrive who are on the spectrum and they're living on campus. And so it was really important that we shared this information for everybody. And then that way, when there's a student participating in a clubhouse event across campus at a different dorm, then um, the staff there are aware of the program and aware of what happens if there's a student who's getting um, upset about something like what are some things that we can do and so working with housing was a major major factor uh, but I think one of the one of our secrets to and I'm sure you guys don't have this do you guys have staggered move-in times for housing like everybody moves in different times yes did I see that so there is somebody from housing I saw human resources, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I don't want to spend too much time on housing then because I want it to be really helpful for, for everyone. But one of the things that really helped us was having um, not priority move-in, but having a move-in time that was designated based on the, the other LLCs. And so the Thrive students moving in a day early meant less students. It meant less parking and having to walk and carry things and being hot. And it meant less overstimulation, like there's not all the big DJs and sound booths and students being there for the first time. And there's tons of people in and out of rooms being able to move in. And we um, and actually housing helped us do this, but we identified this as an accommodation need. It's a housing accommodation. And we our office worked to include that in our documentation. And so students could request this housing accommodation to move in. And it would be that as long as the buildings were open at the same time, but they could use this accommodation so that they could get moved in and settled without having all those um, extra challenges. Is that my computer? I hear something. Okay. If there's questions, please raise, please put them in the chat for Mary Rose. I hear it too. I think, yeah, it was Nancy. She, she's on mute now. Okay. <laughs> so Sorry. that's okay. For, for academic advising, um, they're my favorite partners on campus. I will even give my good friend Kelly a shout out because she's the director of first year advising. And there is no way our students would be in the, the right classes with the right professors, with the right schedules, if it weren't for her amazing staff and being so patient with our Thrive students and um, being able to follow like a few simple strategies like giving an outline. So every time um, Kelly meets with a student, 
The second they sit down, she reiterates and opens with, okay, this is why you scheduled to meet with me today. And this is what we're going to accomplish during your time with me. And she even goes so far as this is what we're going to accomplish in the next 30 minutes of this appointment. Because just setting that expectation out there is really helpful for her to know that the student is not going to sit in my office for two hours and, you know, look up every single class that's offered. But we're limited to 30 minutes and we're specifically focusing on this one purpose, this one item. It's removing these holds. It's talking about um, the prereqs that's not offered or whatever it might be, but it's very specific. So the student even knows that this is what they can expect out of this time that's set aside with the advisor. And I think... Um, I, I don't know who asked the question, do I recommend uh, registering, like encouraging students to register? We actually have started something brand new on, at our campus. Like it's so new that not even all the advisors are aware, but um, we're working with Thrive students that we, we have them share their accommodations with their academic advisors, where typically when a, a student requests to have their accommodation sent to faculty, they're only sent to the faculty members in the courses they're registered in. That's it. Academic advisors are not faculty members, so they're not receiving these letters of accommodation. However, working with advisors, we know how important it is, like an advisor needs to be aware that a student has testing accommodations. That's my biggest example. If an advisor knows that Jess has testing accommodations, the advisor is not going to suggest that Jess takes an 8 a.m. class on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, followed by a 9.15 class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That way you get all your classes done and you can have the whole rest of the day and you have Tuesdays and Thursdays completely off. Well, Jess not disclosing or sharing that she has an accommodation for testing and she uses extended time for testing, what happens when her 8 a.m. class has a midterm and she gets double time and now she's going to miss her 9.15 class and her faculty members, are they going to be okay with you missing class because you're taking a test for another class? Nine, no. And it's not something, what's crazy is the 915 professor is not obligated to excuse um, a student missing class because that's a scheduling thing. And so that's why an advisor knowing that, I'm going to make sure I don't advise just to sign up for classes. Make sure you give yourself a break between classes. Even for a physical disability, if you're using a motorized wheelchair or if you're using any kind of assistive device, I don't want to suggest you take a class in building one that's right here. The testing center is all the way on this side of campus. Your next class is all the way over there. Like, is it going to set the student up for the best opportunity to learn when they're having to run across campus? And then that's not even including if it's raining or they can't find parking and all these things to, to consider. But if that all starts with the advisor being aware of what accommodations the student might be using for their own learning success. So I think that I, and I don't know if I got a chance to talk about that when we were doing it in person, but I was like, I don't know why I didn't. We're so excited about it and it's working so well so far. So we were trying, we went back and forth with our legal team about having something in our system that identified um, if a student was registered with our office, but legal was saying, uh -uh, we don't, that's, that sounds like confidentiality and no, we're not doing it. We're like, even if it's voluntary, like we want students to choose to notify and let people know they still said no. So we're like, okay, well, we still think this is a good idea. So the next best thing is to educate and advocate for the students to do this themselves. And it's working so much better because the student is taking ownership and notifying and saying, Hi, Jess, I know you're my advisor. I just wanted to remind you that these are the accommodations that I use the most in case you have any questions before we meet with our next advising session. The emails I got already from advisors saying, thank you so much for having you know um, Evan share this. It made such a difference when we met with him because right off the bat, we knew what to factor in and it didn't have to be like this long drawn out struggle of what finding a good fit. So it made a really big difference. Should I pause here, Mary Rose, for questions? You've just been getting some really great comments. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm all about discussion, so please feel free. Um, I didn't see. There is one question. I could read it out loud to you. Sure. Um, Dr. Chapman asks, as an advisor, I have a clue with my advisee works with our DRC. Is it appropriate for me to ask the student? So you can't, and we know this by like it's um it's it's not okay for me to ask Jess if she has a disability. I know I can't ask that, but what I can say is, Jess, what resources on campus do you use, such as the counseling center, the the DRC, or the tutoring center? Are these any of the services that you use on campus? Jess might say, I've never heard of the tutoring center, but yeah, I think I'm registered with the DRC. That immediately tells you the advisor. Oh, okay. 
Well, can you explain to me a little bit more what supports, what services do you use with the DRC that you find to be most helpful? And having it back on the student to then listen to them explain it to you, that's the best way to know, does the student even realize that they're not using all of their eligible accommodations? Because that's what I find out firsthand, if the student's even using their accommodations appropriately. So another question is, how to best handle a neurodiverse student struggling to manage impulse control during class? Oh, there's so many things I could do with this. Um, I have that on the next slide with faculty that I'm going to, just because there's a whole big section on that. But if, if, if it's okay, what I'm going to do is, I didn't see anybody from tutoring services, but being, um, being involved with training opportunities as much as possible has been really helpful. What we did was we actually brought in some of our ESC teachers or ESC faculty to help with teaching strategies for students with differentiated learning needs. And having the faculty members come to tutor trainings really helped with the teaching aspect. And then having people like me, I come in and I'm talking to tutors and I'm explaining some of the accommodations and how they're used and how that might affect tutoring, the difference between accommodations and modifications. That's a massive, big, big, big um, topic of conversation. A lot of students struggle with not knowing the difference. And a lot of times a student will be asking for something from a professor that's actually a modification. It's changing what the student's learning. And the professor's like, well, I don't really want to get in trouble for not providing this, so I guess I'll do it. Not, that's not even the case at all. It's just a conversation to be had with the, the accessibility office on, you know, hey, the student asked if they could um, give me an oral report instead of writing a paper. Is that okay? I can tell you right now, nope. If unless it's okay with everybody else in that class, if they everybody else can give an oral report, well, then you know that's fine. But if you're saying just this one student, then now you're talking about modifying the curriculum and modifying the course expectations, which is not going to be an accommodation for the student. Um, the other thing I was going to mention for campus events, because I do see a lot of um, well, so on our campus, we'll do like big food truck events. Um, some of them are indoors, some of them are outdoors. And with indoor events, whew, anything Halloween related was was pretty rough with overstimulating flashing lights, smells, lots of screaming, and you know some students not not really being able to take a joke. Like you have somebody who's grabbing ankles under the table, and so really, um, what we found to be really helpful was having sensory spaces. Um, a quiet place where a student could go to calm if they were feeling overwhelmed and overstimulated, and it's set apart, but it's also close enough that anybody could use this sensory space, which makes it very inclusive. Um, and then even things as, as easy as the lighting, what kind of lighting are you using? Is this strobe lighting? Then there needs to be a warning for students who might um, have epilepsy or might have a history of seizures. And our own campus, we were hosting events for orientation and for the Halloween bash using strobe lights thinking it's going to be fun, and there was no um, there was no communication about using them for students that were participating, and sure enough, we did have a student have a seizure in the, in the room where the strobe lights were happening, and it was just as simple as if you have a sign there, then a student knowing what they're diagnosed, they don't have to disclose. It's not an accommodation they can request. They can skip that part and keep on going, and there doesn't have to be like this big drawn-out process, but it you got, it has to be notified. It has to be really clearly communicated in order for um, students to prepare for that too. Okay, I'm gonna pause here because now I see the chat going. <laughs> should I, should I, do you wanna answer questions? Cause here's the, here's the next one. I actually put this in between the two slides cause there's just so much to talk about that I have a feeling that everyone probably is thinking about their own examples. <laughs> So I was thinking we could do that. You could type them in the chat if you are comfortable sharing, or you can unmute and we can we can discuss this way, whatever um, everyone's comfortable with. Because I don't have I don't see everybody, so I don't even know. I mean, whatever everyone's comfortable with, we can do. To go on um, with uh, one of our lovely professors, Joanne, asking about um, managing impulse control during class. She wrote, I have two students that would call out, want to tell stories that weren't relevant to the lesson, but had to finish their story, et cetera. Hey, I'm sorry, my video isn't working, but I'm here. I took myself off, off mute, but I, I've had two different students um, like at different times, um, not in the same class, but kind of presented same behaviors, mm -hmm. like almost like they just couldn't help themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last student I had uh, last fall semester, we um, 
he would he would he would, he would kind of police himself mm -hmm. and he, he would say to me i know i know uh or he would come up to me after class and he's like i know today was a bad day i i got up late or i was thrown off or um you know, we, we, we work things out, but, but what happened in that class was some of the other students, yeah, they started to have, um, for lack of better words, they started to have an immature reaction yeah. to this student, almost like high school. Um, and I, huffing and going, oh. Well, one day somebody was tapping their pen and the neurodiverse student turned around and was like, stop doing that, you know, really kind of bit the kid's head off. <laughs> and that didn't set things off very well. Sure. Um, so I, one day when he wasn't at, in class, I had to tell everyone, you know, mm -hmm. very carefully, uh, very diplomatically, like, hey, you know, some of us sometimes we're different and you guys <laughs> need to start acting your age too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think for me, more of what came out of that was not so much the neurodiverse student, but then some type of training for students that are not neurodiverse and say, hey, these are your classmates too. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that, um, that can be pulled apart from that. Um, everything that I'm thinking, because this is the number one thing I get asked about from whenever I work with faculty members is um, calling out in class, disrupting the lecture, and um, like, how do I how do I bring the conversation back to what I am teaching on when it's gone so far over here and the students not picking up on my hints that you know that's not on topic. And a lot of it, it's so circumstantial because it always depends on every single individual class and how it's presented. But I we have really um, focused on setting the expectations at the start of the semester, at the start even the start of the class. And um, so I also teach. And one of the, whenever I teach in person or even when I was doing on virtual um, in Zoom, the very first slide, the very first anything that students see as they come in is a reminder of the expectations. So reminder of the expectations, mm -hmm. nobody asks, nobody contributes, raises their hand more than two times in a class. Because then that way I can make sure that all students have an opportunity to share. Or if it's a time limit, nobody, um, we only, when we're sharing, we're taking turns no more than two minutes to make sure that everybody's got shared um, microphone time or it's um, until everybody else is gone, you're going to, you know, one per you're going to wait until everybody else has answered and then you can choose to contribute again. But the biggest things for being off topic are, um, I find them to be stemmed more from, okay, does anybody have any questions? Well, that's a really open-ended question. Or does anybody have anything they'd like to add to this? And there, it's very open-ended versus, does anybody have any questions about the chapter three that we're talking about today? Mm -hmm. And then does anybody have um, does anybody have anything they'd like to add to the the reading that we were just covering and being a lot more specific and then that way the expectation is reiterated. And so I guess my question more for you is Joanne is how is the student starting that off topic that impromptu completely unrelated story that has to be finished. Well, it would start on topic. Mm -hmm. and Then it would spark another thought in them and. <laughs> There were times, so so the this last student, I was I was I was really good. We I would go up, you know, to the desk, and I would kind of gently tap on the desk, and I say, "Hey, you know what? Why don't you finish that story with me mm -hmm. after class? Why don't you come up to me after class?" Because Did that ever worked. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For that particular student, that worked. That's good. That's I and I've had I do just today. I had the student standing in my doorway, and in the middle of the sentence, there's not going to be. Like, and that's more a comfort thing. Like, I don't want to be rude and I definitely don't want other students to think I'm being rude, but I need to teach this lesson. We only have this short amount of time. So I've got to cut you off and there's no easy way. And that's about reasserting re, um, uh, your authority as the faculty member. That's always the thing I go back to with the faculty. Can't you just come in and make sure he doesn't interrupt? You don't want that because the second I leave, it's going to be worse because now the student you've just given me all your your classroom authority and it's not my class it's yours but being yeah. able to cut somebody off and then say that sounds like a really interesting topic for us to finish after class 
And then immediately, not even waiting for a yes, I understand, or can I just finish this, immediately going on to, if everyone can go, or whatever it might be that next step, can everybody look at this next slide? Or, or even what I've done is the very next student, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this slide? And then immediately having somebody else speak to move the, move the yeah, um, momentum yeah. forward. Oftentimes he would then come, he would apologize to me after mm -hmm. class. And I would say to him, it's okay, you don't have to keep apologizing. Ah, see, here's the thing. Don't ever say it's okay. Well, you shouldn't, it's not that you shouldn't ever, but when you say, oh no, it's okay, you're actually saying it's okay to interrupt. It's okay to keep telling your story. It's okay to be off topic. What mm -hmm. really can happen if they apologize, I really appreciate you apologizing because it's important that we can cover whatever we need to in class. Thank you for thank you for being mature enough to apologize. I want to recognize because that is important to recognize and reinforce that I'm glad you see that it's off topic and it's disruptive for the class, but I don't want to say it's okay because that all that's doing is telling you when it's in my class with me, it's okay for you to keep doing that. Okay. Thank you for that. Not, not that I, and please don't think I'm not going to, I mean, it's your class. So I don't want to like, don't do that. But I, that's what I'm, I'm telling mentors that remember, don't say it's okay. Cause that's the first thing that comes out of your mouth. That's the first thing they're hearing. Everything else after that is going to be tied back to, but you said it's okay. Mm. If we're being literal and explicit. Right. And if they, and if they are literal in their thinking to begin with. Yep. And especially cause you start with it's okay. <laughs> it's so interesting, like how much we can talk about that. I, I mean, these are the things I'm like, I was trying to figure out like how would the best way to go with this, this session. And I really want it to be led by, by you all who are attending, because again, I talk about this stuff all day, every day. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to share maybe some of the, the challenges or if there's a specific incident that you're thinking of and it's just bugging you you're like, man, I wish this part or whatever it is. If not, I'll keep on going we to the do next. We have um, another comment in the chat, so I'll okay. read it. Okay. We had an autistic student who was making inappropriate, politically incorrect comments and upsetting the other students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. How do you tell a student that their speech is volatile? Uh, I almost want to say, what does everybody else say? Janine, I see you kind of smiling. I saw us. What do you think? What do you think should be said? Well, I, some of the other comments in the chat right now are we're, we're kind of commenting on the necessity and difficulty of learning how to be very direct. And yes. <laughs> I think, you know, all of us are socialized into assuming that indirect speech is polite speech. And mm. that strategy of communication simply doesn't work very well in these um, situations with students who just simply need you, really need Absolutely. you to just tell them yes. what are the expectations, what are the boundaries. Yes. Um, and so we kind of have to do all this internal work of getting over ourselves um, and on the front wanna... end. So I think, I mean, maybe the answer here is just um, student, the thing you said in class today is volatile and upsetting mm -hmm. and it's getting in the way of doing what we need to do in the classroom and i need you to work on stopping <laughs> and you're absolutely and, right nope and if you can right. do it calmly then it's not you're still the problem is that in my head i'm still like i'm being so rude and it's just yeah. and that's my problem to work on right and sure. i don't know advice about that from your end would be great so but then I, i'll say Yes. Did I, I, just, I, I think it's it's a twofold because I think in today's climate, we're trying to be so sensitive of not offending students, mm -hmm. you know, marginalized, minoritized groups, and we're trying to be inclusive and in, um, myself being of a minoritized group, but yet, so I think we carry that over with neurodiverse mm -hmm. students, not realizing like, okay, they actually need directness. So how do we toe that line and when is it appropriate to be direct mm -hmm. as opposed to with other students, we're trying to be really careful about how we phrase our words. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's just all over, right? Higher ed, K through 12 right now. And I think, and I think you, and you're, you're touching on again, a few different things that um, I don't want to give you one answer that I think is going to, this is how it should always be. Cause that's, I, I, even, I recognize that's not the case and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be truthful for me to say, well, if you just do this, then that won't happen. Cause that's also not the case. But I think that, um, and I use this in my own teaching, for example, that it helps me when Anita says to me, 
Tara, what you said isn't appropriate for this class. I understand that it's your personal opinion. However, the discussion that we're having um, is on this specifically. And if you want to add some more personal thoughts, I'd be happy to stay with you after class. But that topic or however you're saying it isn't um, appropriate for what we're talking about right now. Me, the student, I can appreciate that I made a mistake. What I shared wasn't appropriate for this class. And more importantly, it also tells everybody else in the room that the, if, if they're uncomfortable or if I'm like, dude, did you hear what he said? And the professor's not gonna say anything. We don't want, like, you don't wanna set the precedent. So it's important some in some cases for, for that to be addressed in the classroom immediately after it happens, because, and again, this is very specific to our students. Um, I had a student, I asked him to stay after class because he, the way, what he was talking about, not at all appropriate for the conversation we were having, but I had him stay after class. And then I said, do you realize how you said this was not at all appropriate? And the student just blank look and was like, I have no idea what you're talking about because they didn't associate that it wasn't appropriate because nobody said it wasn't appropriate. So they were just, they weren't trying to offend. They were just sharing a personal thought. So for me, it's important that it's addressed immediately so that the student who might be um, on an inappropriate topic recognizes, oh, I shouldn't be talking about this topic in this setting. Not that it's wrong to talk about, but this setting is not the best place for it. And that's that's my one way. The other thing that I always, and it goes more back to what Janine, you were thinking like, how do we teach ourselves that it's okay? Oh, I talk about this a lot. The most important thing that a faculty member can do and any staff person can do is to establish themselves as the authority in that classroom. And I think it's because of been, we've been doing this for so many years that students look to you, the faculty member, as the person who's going to make us all feel safe. Um, I can't learn if I don't feel safe in this room. I can't learn if I feel like you don't respect my, um, my, my, uh, my personal choices, my religion. I can't learn from somebody if I feel like I'm gonna be attacked or if I'm always on the spot. Like there's so many things that are all tied back to that feeling of safe. As a faculty member, that is our ultimate responsibility is to provide that safe learning environment. What that looks like might be having really harsh expectations um, in the syllabus. If you call out, you will be asked to leave the class. Or if you are talking, whatever it might be, that's all on the faculty member, but more importantly is how is it demonstrated in the class? So if there is somebody talking about something that's really um, inappropriate, how the faculty member responds to it tells everybody else in the room either that it's okay or that that is not okay. And, it, and when you address it right there, it tells the other students in the room, I feel safe because no matter what, this person's going to interrupt and stop whatever is not, whatever's not supposed to be happening and can and address it, but you're not going to be mean if you're like, it's not the most appropriate place to talk about that right now. I understand that you're very passionate about this topic, and I think it would be a great idea for us to continue this when it's just you and I in my office. It's still telling everybody, we can agree to disagree in a different setting. Agree to disagree in a room full of other students and in like a back and forth is not an, a safe place to have that. I think I'm going to keep going. <laughs> just because. I put that break in there to talk about, um, and I have no idea what time it is too. Okay, um, I put I put that break in there because I had the challenges of um, of campus staff, and then I had the challenges of faculty. And this is the one that um, I think it was Joanne, the one that you were sharing, the one that I get asked about the interrupting um, in in the classroom. A lot of it is addressed right from the front when the communication of course expectations happens right away. I swear the most important tool that faculty members have is the syllabus. Even, even in housing, the roommate agreement, the most important thing that students have, that one thing, that guiding document that is um, continuously telling me as a student here in this class for the next 16 weeks, these are the things that you are going to expect me to do and not do in your presence. And the, the clearer and more concise that um, syllabus is, the better I'm gonna do in your class because I know black and white, I don't, you don't accept late work under any circumstances. Don't even ask, you're, it's not gonna be accepted. Versus if something comes up, let me know, I'm sure we'll work something out. It's very, it's very misleading and I don't know what that means. And so having the very clear, or if it's a late policy and I, I some, some are like, well, I think it's too harsh then you can just put something in there. Late work is only accepted with um, approved documentation. 
that's very clear. So before I go on and, and I start saying, can I submit this later? Will you still give me full credit? Why haven't you graded it? You can refer me back to the syllabus. Well, please refer the syllabus page three where I talk about late work or missing work and my policies on that. And it's right there from day one. So it does not matter what happens. We've got expectations that are in there. Um, I have so many things on this page. Where in the um, in the syllabus it talks about um, accessibility office and campus resources is really important. So we know typically that first day of the semester, um, faculty they will review the course syllabus and the expectations, and everybody thinks it's the most boring class. You don't have to go. Whatever it's it's the most important class for the rest of the semester because that first class sets the precedent of what students will be experiencing every time they come in. So if you start that class showing up late to your own um, class, um, not knowing what you're talking about, it sets the precedent for the rest of the semester. And I, I, I see this over and over and over again with students that um, I don't I don't have like I don't have that same academic respect for someone when they show up unpre unprepared, but yet are now getting mad at me because I'm not prepared, but you're the one setting the example for me. So a lot of these things, and I see it in the syllabus, where is the disability disclosure statement? Is it um, on the very front page or is it on the second page where it lists all of the campus resources? Or is it on the back of the 30 page document and it's a one sentence and it tells me where to go and that's it. How all that information is listed in the syllabus tells me the student how you feel about all these things. So if you have it listed with all of the other campus resources, you consider it to be a campus resource. If it's listed all the way at the back with one sentence and it doesn't tell me about how to access it, that tells me how you feel about this resource. And so mm -hmm. from a student perspective, and I actually got student feedback when I was doing a faculty training for my own faculty, we had students, we took the professor's name off the syllabus and we had students grade the syllabi. And that was one of the, the coolest activities that we could do. And these were students who were not in these classes. So there was not a like a potential um, overlap. These were students who either already graduated or they were in completely different majors. But the feedback they gave was really helpful. Like I would, I wouldn't know what the late policy is because there's nothing in here, or I don't know um, the best way to schedule an appointment with my professor because there's nothing in here about their office hours. Things like that that really make a difference for students to feel successful. And going back to feeling safe in this learning space, um, it starts with the syllabus. Okay, are we good, Mary Rose? Yes, we are good. We have about fifteen minutes left. So, and we were talking already, uh, um, addressing in-class uh, or addressing discussions or in-class disruptions. What I've done is um, I've always advised faculty, this should be in the syllabus. The in, especially if you're doing a discussion style class, it's so helpful right off the bat for a student who's in my Thrive program to see um, in-class discussions make up a large part of our weekly meetings. Each student is, is expected to participate, um, meaning taking turns in, uh, in discussions over talking and over talking on peers will result in penalty or point deduction. That's helpful for everybody to know. It's important that we have group discussions and then you explain it in the syllabus. Now, when that disruption happens, it makes it a lot easier for me to talk to a disruptive student because it's right here at the beginning, my expectations for everybody on or on, like it doesn't matter what their diagnosis is. This is something I want everybody to be participating. That's the only way we can get through this as a group. Um, let me make sure. I think I've, well, I already addressed even the not being registered and including it in your campus resources. Does anybody have questions with these? Because I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> okay, we only have 15 minutes left. So what I have here are several, there's resources in here um, that a lot of a lot of this stuff is going to touch on a lot of even what I was saying, but I didn't want to just give you a bunch of links because you can do that anytime. I really wanted us to talk about some of this. Like, what are you experiencing and what are you seeing? And then because I, Joanne, I might my suggestions for you might be completely useless because I don't know the full context of how your class is set up, the relationships you have with students, and all of these things that are all factors. But um, we can we can figure these out by talking about them. And I think that's the most important thing is how are you addressing it? And if it's working, then that's a great thing. But like Janine was saying, um, that's more something that has to happen internally on, for faculty. That really can't happen until we're talking about it. Mm. All right, I just wanted to, I told, I told my students I would share some photos of them. 
because I didn't realize that Andrea pointed this out that I didn't have a single photo or anything. My students are very obsessed with Legos. And, <laughs> and this is actually a student, Victor. So what's great about the Thrive program, students have the opportunity once they've been in the program and they're figuring things out, they can work for Thrive. So Victor is a mentor. He gets paid to mentor new Thrive students. And that's my big cycle of accountability and like natural, um, natural socialization. Victor builds Legos with his mentees and he's built the Titanic and all that stuff. But um, I told him I was going to make sure I put, he's in Washington DC this week for his internship at the White House. So he's, he, and he's again, telling us he can't really do a whole lot. Um, he can't share a lot of what he's doing. <laughs> so I have it kind of, I, I had it left here. I rushed a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that I, where's my questions? I just wanted to leave it open for whatever questions, whatever, um, whatever we can have a conversation about that. And we can continue these. It doesn't have to be just in the next 12 minutes. <laughs> I, I had come in late for a second. So the, the piece about students who are not registered and mm -hmm. about um, going to like a disability resource center, mm -hmm. what, what if a student doesn't want to um they don't want and and it's completely understandable there's a lot of stigma behind it that we're still we're working really hard to um dispel those um that's a conversation i have more often than i'd like to admit that well i don't want to register i don't really have a problem so it circles back to the faculty members or whoever's um the staff because the most important thing if you could take away anything from today's session it's that um disability does not excuse behavior and it's really important that we get this because um, when we're talking about establishing a safe environment for our students to be themselves, it's very important that we also are recognizing and holding each other accountable too. Jess has a diagnosis of ASD. That does not mean Jess gets to say whatever she wants to say, doesn't matter who she offends, because, well, it's because she has a disability, no. Because the student code of conduct, we know that we have student expectations for all students that we are expected to adhere to. And it's incredibly important that we hold all students accountable to that. Now, how we learn it and how we teach, it's gonna be different, those explicit conversations. But more than anything, is it important that it does not matter what their paperwork says, what their diagnosis is, that a disability diagnosis does not excuse behavior. And so what I'm, why I'm mentioning that and really iterating on it is because if a student chooses not to register with um, an accessibility office, that is absolutely their choice. However, it is also mm -hmm. important that the faculty member or whoever it is, they're, you, you're responsible for teaching the class as it is. And if there's a student, and in our student code of conduct, we have a definition of disruptive behavior. And if that disruptive behavior <clears throat> is um is disrupting the learning it's interrupting the learning of other students in the class that's considered a violation of um student conduct and we've had to have the conversations with the student with the conduct officer and the faculty member that the disruptive behavior is now impacting the professor's ability to teach the professor and the other students from learning material in the class because the behavior is so disruptive so if you're choosing to not register with the office and use resources available you're also choosing to be held accountable to the student code of conduct, which very clearly says that what you're doing is violation of this, um, whatever that bullet is of that expectation. Does that help? Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't want to take away from anyone else's question, but I was just curious, you know, I, I also have a K through 12 background and a lot of these students would typically have a one-on-one -on -one para and then they're suddenly <laughs> thrust into higher ed where they do not have a one-on-one -on -one. Right. like this one particular student right mm -hmm. you know I was you know in my mind going god if he just had a para <laughs> well you and know? I think that's why it's so important to again connect with the accessibility office because they might not be able to be a one-on-one -on -one and in every every single one of those classes but they are absolutely um capable of meeting with the student ongoing to address some of those concerns that are happening and mm -hmm. to for, for I, I can speak for our campus, we've had some of our staff members accompany and sit in on classes to help see what's going on. But that's also why the importance of that peer mentor is so powerful because 
Exactly. We students come from a K-12 background and they're so used to teachers and parents doing everything and for them, they don't even know they they're not realizing that, oh, I'm not allowed to just say whatever I want. I've never been told that before. So what do you mean I can't just right, say whatever? Right. Well, because I've never when I was in K-12, I had somebody else just do it for me. So they haven't really had a chance to learn that. But again, that doesn't mean it's okay that you're doing it. It just means that, hey, we that's not okay. Here's how that learning process. Right. Right. Thank you. Though that's a great question. Does anybody have any, um, any other questions? I think we are, yeah, we've got six more minutes. <laughs> so I can talk a little bit more about statistics then because I, I had it planned. Um, so the Thrive program alone. So I showed you and here, let me go back real quick to. So looking at these, these stats again, um, the Thrive program, I've been collecting data on it for 10 plus years. And so I am a big, I don't trust anything unless there's data to back it up. And so I am incredibly passionate and focused on retention data and graduation data and student success data, because I know that students who are more engaged with campus graduate and do better. And so this is just the same for my Thrive students. And students who are participating in the Thrive program, we have a 96% graduation rate. So 96% of the students who are participating in Thrive graduate. And for, for us, a big piece of the program focuses on career components. And 93% of our students are employed within their fields of study, which is very powerful for, for when I'm talking to faculty, like how many of us have a degree and it's not at all what we do. And I'm one of those people, I got a degree in special education to be a, an ESE teacher. That's not at all what I do. It's kind of related though, but they also didn't have the degree. And so 93% of our students are pursuing or they're in career fields that are a fit to what they studied while they were at UNF. And I shared that because um, it's really important to see that students, we're looking at the unemployment rate for neurodiverse graduates at 85%. That does not have to be the case. It doesn't. And I have this little tiny free program that's demonstrating that it's absolutely possible for students to be successful and to be employed after they graduate and leave. All right. I realized I didn't even, ugh, I'm so bad at this. I didn't even share the Thrive Program components. <laughs> Lord. So the Thrive Program, I started it, or we started it in 2012 and we run it. It's focusing on four areas that our accessibility office does not provide. So, and that the reason being because we already have a tutoring center. We already have an amazing advising office. We already have accommodations. So the Thrive Program does not provide anything already established on campus. Thrive focuses on social skills, independent living skills, career skills, and a fourth component that I am, that's my baby, executive functioning. And I actually developed curriculum for my exec executive functioning class that um, first year advising, they use some parts of it because it's so helpful for first year students. But we focus on those four areas. And so students receive, um, they attend the weekly Thrive class with me that I teach the executive functioning class that's using a planner, a hard planner, that's time management, it's prioritizing, it's scheduling, stress management, all these wonderful things that everybody experiences, but they're doing it with peers and from the way I set it up is they're learning it the same way that they're learning um, anthropology on Canvas and the same way they're learning e e e class stuff. That, and so they have to participate in discussions on Canvas the same way their classes are set up. They get a grade. We talk about the grades um, all semester long with their mentors. And so um, that's kind of a, a piece of what I was trying to share about the Thrive Program. And I think a lot of that really does tie back to why we see so much success with it. All right. That's it for me. My alarm's going off. It says 428. I talked a lot and I talked very quickly. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to sit uh, back and sit through it. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask or add? Now's your, now's your chance. <laughs> I did have a comment. Yes. Um, again, Dr. O, thank you for doing this. Um, my name is Rihanna. I actually am in SAS over in UNS. So SAS with two S's. Oh, awesome. Um, always getting confused, obviously. Mm -hmm. Best offices to mix up. <laughs> That's right. Always, always. <laughs> um, and just as a comment, I think it, one of our tutors asked me a question about a year ago um, when I brought up potentially offering um, training for working with neurodiverse students of how often we realistically see it. And 
my response was you won't see it if there's not a space that is created where it's welcoming for them and that we can actually provide um, and cater to their needs. So I'm going to send you an email yeah. if you are able to attend the training. That is so people. powerful. That is so powerful. Like creating that space. I think that it just, it sets a precedence of inclusion that is so much beyond just saying that we're inclusive. It demonstrates and shows, and it really does tell students, like students see everything. Even my, like my students, they notice, Dr. O, you didn't wear your sub so sweater today. And it's like, hey, thanks for, would it, I, well, all right. But so they'll notice and they see this. And so the, the best thing that we can do, and I do this is being authentic. So learning from students and they know this, Dr. O, I gotta tell you, you did this wrong okay, can you show me how to do it right? So I can make sure, I, and it's everything from pronouns to like, I'm learning just as much as students are. And so creating that space is so valuable because students really do grow and they grow tremendously when they're in that safe space. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to connecting with you yeah. uh, so much again. Thank everyone for coming. Mary Rose, I think, um, I know that I, I know, 